Okay, so this is a part two to my previous video, Anatomy of a Headshot. It's not required that you watch it, but it would definitely make this video a little bit easier to understand. Firstly, I just want to preface this by saying that the majority of people who are shot in the head die. There's no question about it. But there are some rare cases where people have lived. The cases that I'll mention later in this video are people who had incredibly rare circumstances that ultimately saved their lives. Exact replication of these circumstances doesn't mean one would have the same outcome as the survivors. They are the exception, not the rule. Surviving a gunshot to the head is not like recovering from a broken arm or leg. It results in life-altering effects of mental, emotional, and physical hardships. Even with full recovery, the victim is usually never the same. So, just to clear some things up, when I say shot in the head, I don't mean here, or here, or here, or here. By shot in the head, I specifically mean a bullet penetrates your skull and goes directly into your brain. With that cleared up, let's look at various factors that have to take place in order to give you a chance to survive. The first thing you'll want is to not get shot with a rifle or shotgun. As explained in my previous video, a rifle is a high-powered firearm, and the amount of kinetic energy the bullet has as it strikes your skull is far too much to give you a fighting chance to survive. And as for shotguns, if it's point-blank or even a few feet away, you're not going to live. I'm sure there'll be some comments along the lines of, well, if you get shot with a 20-gauge shotgun with birdshot from 20 feet away, you won't die, idiot. Okay, let's be real here, we're talking lethal distance with lethal rounds, either buckshot or a slug, within relatively close range, like 5 or 6 feet, not 100 yards away. Yes, yeah, some people do live after a self-inflicted shotgun wound to the head, but that's because they didn't hit their brain. Usually, they end up taking off their face or their jaw. The gun is typically aimed this way or this way, where the shot does not end up hitting the brain or brain stem. I mean, we're talking about a scenario where you already have less than 10% chance of living on a good day. If you aim a shotgun at your head at close distance with buckshot or slug, and the path is directly from barrel to brain, you're not going to live. Sorry for the rant, moving on. Instead, the best weapon to be shot with to increase your chances to survive is a low-powered firearm, like a pistol or a 22 caliber rifle. The next factor is distance. The farther the distance, the more time the bullet has to lose energy. Obviously, if you are 150 yards away from a low-powered firearm, you have more chances of surviving. The opposite of a long-distance shot is a contact shot, where the gun is placed against your head and then fired. By the way, here's an interesting fact regarding shot distance. A forensic study gathered the results of bullet exit wounds of multiple homicides and suicides. When a bullet fully passes through a skull, it usually means it was fired at close range or from a high-powered firearm. If it does not pass through, that means it was fired from a long distance or a low-powered firearm. It was discovered that 51% of suicides resulted in the bullet passing through the skull, whereas in homicides, the bullet only passed through 19% of the time. This is because in most suicides, the method is via a contact shot, where the victim places the gun against the head and then fires, so the bullet has peak energy when it hits the skull. Conversely, in homicides, the shot is usually fired from a further distance, so the round does lose some energy. Next, to increase your chances of survival, it's important to only have one hemisphere of your brain damaged. Either left or right means less complications and disruptions to connectivity in the body. Also, the majority of the circulation for the brain is located in the center between the two hemispheres. If a bullet passes through here, it could sever the middle cerebral artery, causing an extraordinary amount of blood loss. Finally, the most important factor in surviving a headshot is medical response time. You could have the best case scenario, but if you don't have quick medical attention, well, you're going to die. It's important to know that sometimes people don't even die right away after getting shot in the head. Don't get me wrong, they're completely incapacitated, but they're able to breathe on their own, without assistance from a machine. In one forensic investigation, a man shot himself in the head with a 357 Magnum, a notoriously powerful handgun. The victim was unconscious and immobile, but was still alive and breathing for approximately 1 hour and 34 minutes before finally dying. This isn't to say that the victim would have lived if they got treatment, it's just to show that sometimes you don't actually die immediately after getting shot in the head, and why medical response time is so crucial. So the question is, how is someone treated when they're shot in the head? Well, it turns out that the procedure is actually pretty straightforward. When the brain is injured, it begins to swell. If it swells too much, it will press on the inside of the skull, causing more damage to itself. To prevent this from happening, part of the skull is removed in a procedure known as a craniectomy. This allows the brain to expand and swell without hurting itself. 
From here, surgeons simply remove bullet and skull fragments and any dead tissue and allow the brain to take care of the rest. You see, surgeons cannot treat torn brain tissue like regular tissue. It can't have stitches drawn through it or get bandaged up. Brain tissue is full of billions of neurons. Bandaging and pricking the tissue with stitches would cause more damage to these very sensitive nerve cells. Instead, the patient is stabilized and the brain is allowed to repair itself. Amazingly, the brain manages to repair damaged tissue and rewire the neurons over time fairly well. It doesn't rewire everything back to 100%, but it does a fairly good job in creating new neural pathways. Now that we know what it takes to survive a headshot, here are some real-life cases where a victim was shot in the head and, under the right circumstances, survived and maintained a fairly normal life. One night, Tammy Sexton's husband came home drunk, like he had done many times before. Except this time it would end much differently. A fight ensued between the two. Her husband grabbed a 38 caliber pistol, shot her in the head, and then himself. The bullet entered above her left eye, penetrated two inches deep into her brain, ricocheted around the left side of her skull, and then exited behind her left ear. Amazingly, when police arrived, they discovered Sexton was not only alive, but she was making tea, all the while with a gunshot wound in her head. A combination of shock, adrenaline, and most importantly, the bullet missing vital portions of her brain allowed her to not only be alive, but conscious. She was airlifted to USA Medical Center and given a craniectomy. Today, she lives a normal life. Next is arguably the most famous gunshot survivor in recent history, due to her fight for women's rights in the Middle East. Malala was a 15-year-old Pakistani activist who was quite vocal on social media about women's rights in Pakistan, despite receiving multiple death threats. On October 9, 2012, while walking to school with her classmates, a Taliban gunman saw her and ordered her to kneel down. The gunman drew a 45 caliber revolver, aimed it downward at her head, and then fired a single round. The bullet passed through her left eye socket, traveled through the middle part of her left ear, and into her left shoulder. Due to the trajectory of the bullet, only a small portion of the left frontal lobe of her brain received damage, and it was limited to only one hemisphere. She was given a craniectomy and later on recovered. She would go on to receive the Nobel Peace Prize for her actions on women's rights. In August of 2006, Rachel Brzezinski was a typical 17-year-old high school student. She and her friends had heard of an abandoned haunted barn out on the countryside. They drove to the barn at night and walked onto the property. The owner of the property heard trespassers and shot at them in the dark with a 22 caliber rifle. One of the rounds struck Brzezinski on the back right side of her head, passed from the right hemisphere into the left hemisphere towards the front of her head, and stopped just above her left eye. The 22 caliber bullet was a hollow point, so when it struck her head, it mushroomed out and doubled in size. A total of four lobes in her brain were damaged, and even worse, the bullet crossed both hemispheres. Fortunately, Brzezinski was quickly rushed to the hospital and underwent an emergency craniectomy. Though bullet and bone fragments were removed from the brain, the bullet itself could not be recovered. Additionally, she had a portion of her temporal lobe removed due to it being in a necrotic state. Though she has fully recovered, she does have memory issues and continues physical therapy to this day, but overall has had a fairly normal life. She was even featured on the cover of People magazine in 2011. The farmer who shot at a group of teenagers in the dark, nearly killing one, was sentenced to 19 years in prison. Gabby Giffords was an Arizona congresswoman representing Arizona's 8th Congressional District. On January 8, 2011, Giffords was attending a meet-and-greet with residents in her district. In the crowd was a 23-year-old paranoid schizophrenic named Jared Loeffner, who was in possession of a 9mm handgun. Loeffner walked up to a table Giffords was sitting at and shot her directly in the forehead from three feet away. The bullet entered above her left eye, passed through her brain, and exited out the back of her head. Two factors contributing to Gifford's survival was the bullet only passed through one hemisphere, thereby limiting damage to the rest of her brain. Additionally, her campaign intern, Daniel Hernandez Jr., performed CPR on her, prolonging her life until medics could transport her to the hospital. Gifford's quick access to medical care being a politician undoubtedly saved her life. The bullet having damaged her frontal lobe made it difficult for her to speak and control voluntary movements, but following intense physical and speech therapy, she was able to make a full recovery. In 2012, to show her notable improvement, she led the Pledge of Allegiance at the Democrat National Convention. 
yourself back. Here's the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. At this rate, it would seem that getting shot in the head with a low-powered firearm and then having immediate medical attention right after is the perfect formula to survive. Well, not exactly. There was one infamous case where everything fit the criteria perfectly, and yet the victim did not live. Specifically, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was a senator from Massachusetts who was running for president in 1968. On June 5th, Kennedy gave a speech at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles after winning the California primary. Afterwards, he exited through the hotel's kitchen and greeted 17-year-old busboy Juan Romero. At that moment, a Jordanian national, Sirhan Sirhan, walked up behind Kennedy and fired eight shots from a 22 caliber handgun. Four of the eight shots had hit Kennedy one behind his right ear, one at the top of his right shoulder, and two just to the left of his right armpit. He was rushed to Good Samaritan Hospital 16 miles away. Neurosurgeons performed a craniectomy but were unable to remove the lodged bullet and bone fragments from Kennedy's brain. Over the course of 26 hours of intense neurosurgery, Robert F. Kennedy eventually passed away on June 6, 1968. Considering the circumstances of the previous survivors, Kennedy should have lived. He was shot with a low-powered handgun using a small caliber bullet. Only one hemisphere of his brain was damaged and he received immediate medical care. At first glance, we could say it's the luck of the draw that Kennedy died and they lived. However, looking deeper, we see that it's not the case. Kennedy was shot with a low-powered handgun and using a small caliber bullet. Yes, he only had one hemisphere affected, and yes, he received top medical care. But one thing was very different in Kennedy's case than was in the rest. The location of the bullet. The bullet that entered behind Kennedy's ear damaged the right cerebellum and right occipital cortex. This caused reduction in cerebral functions and edema, or a buildup of fluid in the local area. The brainstem being adjacent to this region was damaged due to this swelling. The brainstem is crucial in controlling automatic functions like regulating heart rate, breathing, and sleeping. A swelling brain putting pressure on the brainstem would damage it, thereby causing the person to stop breathing. In Kennedy's case, as fluid built up, the brainstem became more and more damaged from the pressure, thereby interfering with signaling to the lungs to breathe involuntarily. Surgeons noted that as Kennedy's intracranial pressure increased, his breathing slowed down to the point that he finally succumbed at 1.44 a.m. on June 6th, 26 hours after he was shot. It's important to remember that despite these rare occurrences, surviving a gunshot to the head is the exception, not the rule. 